Good morning, Jesus Image Church family. And we want to welcome our online viewers. I was just so in awe this morning of how, what an honor it is to be in this place. What an honor it is to sit in the glory of God and to sit in the presence of God, that we could be anywhere, but the Holy Spirit actually drew you in this spot for such a time as this to praise the one who is lifted, to praise the one who is seated at the right hand of the throne. And I just felt such a, such a, an incline in my heart of how to thank God. We need it right now, everyone that's watching, everyone that's in their seats, can we just thank Jesus with our own mouth? Something will break. Something will break when we start thanking Him. Thank Him for the air in your lungs. Thank Him for the, your heartbeat. Thank Him for Him getting you to this place safely. There's so much to be thankful that we could be anywhere, that there's places that can't even worship God without getting arrested, but we're here to praise Him and lift Him high. So as I read the scripture, just start thanking Him, everyone. Show. I exalt you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. What happens in this room, Lord? What happens in this room if we all look at you, that we lay down our burdens and we know that you are the one that picks them up, God, that you are the one that is lifted and high, Lord, and we just thank you, Jesus, right now for how your presence is gonna come. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for the ones that will be saved today, Lord. Let us never take for granted one salvation, God. Thank you, Lord. Let us remember where you took us out of the pit, God. And we just thank you, Jesus, Lord, that for this time, God, that we all will look at one thing, Lord, that we've laid down the distractions, God, and we thank you, Lord, that we will look towards you, our strength, our mighty counselor, our fighter, and our defender, Jesus. And we just thank you for what you're gonna do today. In your great name I pray, amen. Come on, let's lift up some worship in this place today. Oh, we magnify your name, God. You are so worthy, Lord. Yeah.
step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. But we sing, the cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm your the 
Lift up your voice to the Lord. Give him something new. Sing him a new song. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. Come on a little more. Candace, David, I want to hear you.
Just sing softly in the spirit for a moment. Come on, just lift it again, church. Sing softly in the spirit for just a moment. Sound of heaven touching earth. 
this place erupt with praise can you hear it the sound of heaven touching today that are visiting on a missions trip from Bethel, and Ben is a pastor at Bethel, and we love you. You can welcome them real quick. Love you guys so much. Love you. And Michael wants Ben just to pray a blessing over this church right now, so just receive. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Oh. <sighs> Holy Spirit, just ask for the sound of your world breaking into this world right now to begin to break out in this room. God, we're asking for that sound, that sound of Pentecost, of the wind, of your spirit rushing through this place. Father, I'm asking for every square inch of this building to be filled with the manifest glory of God. This isn't an empty prayer for us. We believe this, God. Let your world invade our world now. Holy Spirit, we ask, would you begin to increase your manifest presence in this place? Holy Spirit, not that you need it, but we give you permission. Just begin to move upon your people. We're hungry for you. We honour you, Holy Spirit, in this place. We honour you. We magnify you. Here's what I want us to do just for a moment. Would you just stretch out your hand to the person next to you? Lay your hands on them. I want you to become aware. The Bible says that inside of your belly and outside of your belly flows rivers of living water. The Holy Spirit's inside of you. It's not just inside of you. You're not half empty. You're not half full. You're full to overflowing. The Holy Spirit wants not just to be inside of you, but He wants to flow out of you. And I just want you to pray from that place for the person next to you. The awareness of the Holy Spirit flowing through you. I want you to, with your mouth out loud, begin to ask for more of the Holy Spirit to land on the person next to you. Pray dangerous kind of prayers, the dangerous kind of prayers that you want them to be praying over you right now. Begin to pray over them. I want you to use your mouth, use your words. That's it for the next 30 seconds or so. I'm just going to let you pray. I want to hear your voices. person next to you. Pray for them like you were praying for your son or your daughter. Thank you, Jesus. We want to see more of your glory, Jesus. We need more of your presence, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We thank you, Father. We know you hear every prayer. Thank you, Jesus. in Jesus' name, new depths in the name of Jesus, new wine for you and your family in the name of Jesus, new intimacy with Jesus, deeper intimacy in Jesus' name, deeper revelation of the Word of God, deeper wisdom and understanding, Lord. Make us hungry children, Father, hungry for you like never before, God. Jesus, even from the youngest to the oldest in our families, God, hungry in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. As we were seeing today, your buried body began to breathe. You know, He makes dead things alive again. He makes everything that is dead alive. And I feel like God is doing that for us in this church. He is life. So I thank you, Jesus, that you make all things new. 
you make the dead come alive, Lord. The dead heart that has closed their heart to you comes alive in Jesus' name. The dead and broken person that is dead inside comes alive in you in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father. Lord, and seal it with your precious blood in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we give it up for the worship team today? So we're going to continue worship right now with offering. Yay. All right. Go to Exodus chapter 34. I'm going to read 19 and 20, part of it. I'm going to skip around just a little bit because it's a lot of scripture. 21, 23 through 24. So that's Exodus 34, verse 19, 20, 21, 23 through 24. It says, the firstborn of every animal belongs to me, including the firstborn males from your herds of cattle and your flocks of sheep and goats. No one may appear before me without an offering. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but on the seventh day, you must stop working even during the season of plowing and harvest. Three times each year, every man in Israel must appear before the sovereign, the Lord, the God of Israel. I will drive out all the other nations ahead of you and expand your territory. So no one will covet and conquer your land while you appear before the Lord, your God, three times a year. Lots of things to unpack here. First of all, first fruits. It's vital, church, that you learn what first fruits means. It means whatever comes in through your work or whatever it is. Even my daughter got a $100 gift recently for her birthday. That's a pretty good gift for a 10-year-old, right? And I said, before you spend that, 10% goes to the Lord first. That's what first fruits is. That's giving him your very best. He also deserves the first fruits of your morning, of your time, of your worship. Everything that you give, you have to give God your best. This is a biblical principle. Also, I love how the verse says, don't come to God without an offering. God is too holy. We have to give him all we have. Amen? Doesn't he deserve that? He deserves our very best. Even in times of harvest, you have to make time for God and consecrate your life to him. That means even when God is blessing you, you give your all to him. We have to, we cannot be children that just want the Lord whenever we're in need, but when we have things, we stop going to the Lord. No, God is always available to us. And he wants his children to love him because he loves us so much. When you make God first and obey his commands, like we just read in that scripture, he protects what he has given you. And not only that, he expands your territory. So not only does he protect what he's given you, but he gives you more because he's a good father. And we never give to get from the Lord. We give because we get to and we love him. It's an act of obedience and an act of worship. But God is so good that he takes care of his children. All you have to do is worship the Lord. That's it. And trust him. He is over everything. So let's pray real quick. Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you right now. It is our joy, Lord, to give what already belongs to you, God. You've given us everything. Father, you gave us your only son. You gave us your very best. And it is our joy, God, to give you all that we have. No matter what is happening around the world, God, we know that you are in control. And we trust you no matter what, Jesus. And it's our joy to give. Lord, make us generous, joyful givers. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You can text GIVE to the number on the screen, or you can use the QR code on the screen in the room. If you're watching online, we love our online family so very much. You can also text GIVE to the number on your screen. If you need an envelope, just raise your hands and lift them up high, and our ushers will come and give you an envelope, and you guys are welcome to rush the buckets. We'll be right back. Yours, it's yours, it's yours. 
Before we get started, first of all, today is going to be a really special Sunday, as when Jesus comes, it's always special, right? But I want to properly introduce our friends from Bethel. They came here on a missions trip. Can you guys just stand up so we can honor you? So good to have them. Thank you. I know a lot more coming tonight, right? <laughs> to come here on a missions trip, wow, and serve and be a part of this. We love you. We love our Bethel family. And I'm going to give you a quick update on Michael. We went for his post-op on Tuesday, and the doctor was blown away. He's healing quicker than they expected. Thank you, Jesus. He's... We're so happy. The athlete in him came out. The doctor goes, I love working with athletes because Michael goes, I'm going to work harder than any patient you've ever had. But he's sounding amazing. He's able to talk about 20% of the time now. So it's, we're very confident now he will be preaching very soon. And we cannot wait to have him back. Thank you guys for all of your prayers. From the bottom of our heart, thank you so much. God is truly faithful, and Michael's feeling amazing. There's no more pain when he talks, and really just an answer to prayer. So thank you again. We love you so much. And our, my, our dad, he is like our dad. My dad is here today. He's going to preach the word with us. Don't know where he is, but he'll be coming from that curtain in a second. I see, there you are. Let's welcome my dad. Thank you, thank you. Listen, you sweet people. Thank you. Please be seated. You stay right here. Don't go away. Michael, I'm so glad you're talking now. He's giving me a hard time already, but I love him. Okay, now listen. Uh, this week is a special week for our family. Are you wearing something? Uh, what are you wearing? Uh? <laughs> Honey, you look taller than me. I was just wondering if I lost, if I... <laughs> that short or son, I'm thinking, how come she's taller? All right. Anyways, special week this week because my precious Jessica turns 40.
and Joshua turns 31. Same week. So, but I want to show you, I want to show you pictures of when she was small. And then, and then one special picture when she was really mad at me. That's her when she was a little girl wearing my glasses. That's when I had black hair. Okay, next, next picture. I look kind of... No, back there. Dear God, I need a healing. <laughs> Anyways, uh, how old were you there, babe? I don't know. Huh? <laughs> I don't know. Well, one. young enough for me to carry you. Yeah. <laughs> and then the third one. She was so cute, always so cute. Look a little Benny there looking at his mom and Theo. Wow. <laughs> now, I think the next one is the one you came up in a crusade, right? when you were not too happy with me. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, here, here, you take this mic and tell them why. Can you look at that? Like she was mad. <laughs> That's a bad one, right? She was not very much herself that day. She was like, she was 14 years old and I called her up in front of 20,000 people and she gave me that look. Oh, dear Lord, I think this, we should frame this one <laughs> and put it somewhere so, but you see the difference now between this and that, right? <laughs> Only God can do that, guys. Yeah. Okay. Now, at the end, at the end, I'll sing happy birthday because you took extra time. You promised. Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, let's get in the word. Amen. Oh, How many of you are visitors. Lots of people. Why don't you stand up so we can see you? Maybe you guys have not it before, but oh. give them a big God bless, please. That's wonderful. Precious. Wow. You may be seated. Thank you. Well, you know, with Michael, now his voice is coming back. Thank the Lord. I won't have to come here on Sunday morning. <laughs> this is my second Sunday morning, and you know me in mornings. I only do it for you, you know, because I don't like being up so early. <laughs> Lord, I thank you for what you're about to show us. Thank you for what all, all you've done <clears throat> in this wonderful church with your wonderful people. Bless them today, I pray with your word, and to you, to you belongs the glory. Blessed be your holy name, wonderful, wonderful Jesus. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, go with me to Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy chapter 10. And I want to talk to you about ministering to the Lord not for the Lord, to the Lord, and why that is so important. Um, but before I read the scripture, there is a power failure today in people's lives in the church. It's a serious power failure in many people's lives. And the reason is, is they have failed to minister to the Lord. And when we fail to minister to the Lord, we end up having a power failure. Quite simple. Because biblically speaking, our ministry to the Lord comes before our ministry to the church. Our ministry to the Lord comes before we minister for the Lord. So you really cannot minister to the church or people till you minister to the Lord because you cannot give away what you have not received. You cannot give anyone what God has not given to you as you minister to him. And... Um, <clears throat> You and I cannot be effective in touching people's lives 
till God has touched our life. And that happens when we minister to the Lord. So the first thing before we, 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 we can minister to the Lord, we have to be, we have to be caught up in the wonder of Jesus. You can't minister to him till he becomes more than wonderful in your life. So when we get caught in the wonder of the person of Jesus of Nazareth, then things begin to change. <clears throat> now, ministering to the Lord is so important, and I'm going to show you why. Look at Deuteronomy 10, verse 8. At that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister unto the Lord, to, min to minister unto him, and to bless his name. So here is a whole tribe in Israel that ministered to the Lord. And because they ministered to the Lord, God protected the whole nation and blessed the whole nation of, of Israel. Think, think about this, huh? The people of Israel in the, in the wilderness rebelled more than once. Yet the cloud did not depart. And the fire did not depart. The glory remained. Why? Because one tribe ministered to the Lord. So that tribe ministering to the Lord kept the Lord among the people. Even when they sinned. Think about that. Even when they rebelled. God did not leave them because ministering to him kept his glory among them. That's so powerful. So a whole tribe had one responsibility, minister to the Lord. That's it. That's it. And <clears throat> let's go to 1 Samuel 3. I want to show you something. 1 Samuel 3. In 1 Samuel 3, we have a very amazing uh, picture here. At a time of spiritual, uh, how shall I say, famine, the nation of Israel was going through a time of spiritual famine. The word of the Lord was precious in, in, in those days. No open vision. So this was a time of, uh, of uh, death almost, spiritually. And a little boy comes along named Samuel. And that little boy changed the atmosphere of the whole country. And imagine no open vision. No word of God anywhere. Wilderness, spiritually, they were in the wilderness. Famine. Nobody could hear God. Nobody knew God's presence. A time of uh, great uh, challenges spiritually and, and very big trouble. And there, a little boy. Eight years old. How old? Look what, it, look what it says. And the child Samuel, I'm, I'm looking at verse 1. The child Samuel, not the boy, child, ministered unto the Lord. What a key here, huh? And it says, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. Now that Hebrew word precious means rare, like hardly to to even be recognized, nobody heard it much. There was no open vision. And it says, it came to pass at that time, I'm gonna keep reading, it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down, who was the high priest, in his place, his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And it says, and the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord. That's the lampstand that was never supposed to be out. 
they, they basically gave up on ministering to the Lord altogether, the priests. So the priests now said, ah, we're too tired of putting that lamp on. We're too tired of putting the oil in. We, we, we just don't want to do anything. Now, you've got to understand something. When the lamp is out, no one was ministering in there because they couldn't see anything. How can you see with four skins covering the tabernacle? And those skins made it real dark in there. You had fine linen on top goat's hair, on top ram skin, on top badger skin, no light, no windows. Without the lampstand, nobody went in there. Meaning the tabernacle was empty. The lampstand being out means no sacrifices of blood out there. Why? Well, who could see to even bring the blood in? The lamp out meaning the whole place shut down. And we don't know how long this went on. So it says, and the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. That's a very sad picture of nobody ministering to God. Nobody offering any sacrifices because the blood, even if they had, let's say, someone come with an animal, that blood could not be taken into the holy place or holy of holies on the day of atonement because how can you see in there with the lamp out? So it was a real bad time. And Samuel was laid down to sleep. And the Lord called Samuel. He answered him, here am I. But he, of course, did not know the Lord at that time. He was so young. So he thought that the high priest was calling him. But what happened later? What happened because of that verse, amazing verse 1? It says, and Samuel, the child. Imagine a child doing the job of a whole tribe who wasn't doing their, their job. And one little boy changed the whole nation. So can you. So if the preachers quit doing their job, only one person in this room can change America. Comprende. As one person can change the whole nation. Because one, in fact, maybe I should even say one child can change the whole nation. Because he was, he was a child. And he was eight. Why do we know that? Because that's, <clears throat> that's the age when they were weaned at that time. And when, when his mother was, was finished with that, when he could eat by, his, by himself and not be dependent on his parents for food, she gave him to the high priest. And here's this amazing child changing the nation. And so now, the Lord calls him, and he did not know the Lord yet. Because it says so in verse 7, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord even revealed unto him. So stop, stop right here. Stop. He was ministering to God without knowing his word. So it doesn't mean you have to finish Bible school before you can minister. Think about that. He did not even know the word of the Lord. He began ministering to the Lord before he even knew the Lord. There's a lot of people who know the Lord and are not ministering to the Lord. A lot know his word and not ministering to the Lord. Here's a little boy who began ministering without knowing a whole lot about the Lord. Wow. And so the Bible says that the Lord came, in verse 10, began to reveal himself to little Samuel. Why? Well, because he was ministering to him. How many want God to reveal himself to you? Start ministering to him. Without even knowing the Bible, start ministering to him. 
You say, how can you, how can you do that? Well, quite easy. I'll show you. And now what, what happens? The first thing that happens is the prophetic comes back. Because now the Lord speaks to little Samuel. And now he becomes a little prophet. All the prophets of that day were probably out of business, <laughs> silent, or left the ministry, one of the two. And here is this little prophet of maybe eight, nine, ten years old by that time, changing the nation. And, and he comes to Eli and tells the high priest who should know the voice of God what God told him. Here's a little boy telling the high priest what God was saying. When the high priest himself should have known, but he was too blind and too dull and whatever to not hear God. So, later, it says, and Samuel grew, verse 19, and the Lord was with him. Watch, watch this. And did let none of his words fall to the ground. Why? He was still ministering to the Lord. When you minister to the Lord, he will not let anything you say fall to the ground. So what he started, he continued. And then it says in verse 20, and all Israel, all Israel, watch the whole country now, comes alive. From Dan even to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel, not to Eli. In Shiloh by the word of the Lord. What an amazing. If we stop here, it's a great message already. Because you see the change that little boy brought to the whole country. His own life, the, the, the whole nation changed. Because he understood one thing simple, minister to the Lord. You know, we, we, we had these crusades for years and years uh, all over the world. And people thought I, I, I prayed all day. No, I worshipped. I began worshipping at two and I didn't stop till seven. I would just sit there and weep and worship him. And when I got up on that platform, he showed up with me. So. I walked up one time on the platform in Cincinnati, and within minutes, 40 people on wheelchairs jumped out of their wheelchairs. I didn't even say a word. I didn't preach. I just came up. And I saw it happen with Ms. Schumann time and time and time and time again. I don't remember Catherine preaching a whole lot. She loved to worship. In those meetings in Pittsburgh, she never preached. Never one time. Never one time preached a sermon on Friday mornings. She would come up and start with how great thou art. And she, didn't, she did not have much of a voice. But boy, the anointing was there. You didn't care about her voice. It would crack and sometimes she'd be off key. Nobody cared. Because you just start crying the second she came out. Well, just she walked on and you were, you, you, you were crying. I didn't know why you were crying. And she'd start just leading in worship. And next thing you know, people were, were getting healed left and right. I mean, like big miracles. Not somebody's leg, you know, growing out and all that nonsense. <laughs> it's nonsense. Oh my God, look at this. It's coming out an inch. My God is way bigger than that. I mean, things were happening in those meetings that would shock you. And I mean shock you. They sure shocked me. All the miracles I saw in her meetings, some of them are hard to even describe. I mean, literally hard to describe. But Miss Schumann understood this. She was a worshiper. 
And worship is not, oh, forgive me, a lot of the worship today is just noise. It gives me a headache. Real worship is born by the Spirit. You can't worship God till you know He is holy. Because worship is the result of revelation. Otherwise, you can't worship. Well, anyway, so here's Samuel. God visits him. And because he ministered to the Lord, the whole nation changes. But let's look at something else. Let's look at 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles. And let's look at chapter 5. And let's look at verse 11. It says, and I'm going to read right through verse 14. Let me go back. My little, my iPad has given me a little hard time. I wish I could just go back and use my old Bible. But the problem is my eyes are not what they used to be. And I don't want to wear glasses when I preach. All right. It came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified and did not then wait by course. And the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaf, of Hemenah, these were incredible gifted people raised under David who really understood worship with their sons and their brethren being arrayed in white linen there was hundreds of them having cymbals psalteries harps stood at the east end of the altar and with them 120 priests now just uh, pay pay attention this is incredible you, you got over 400 at that, uh, that one service, singers, with what? With 120 priests with trumpets. It came to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one. Were what? As one. That's a key. Unity in worship is so powerful. It came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpet and the cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord saying he's good for his, for his mercy endures forever, then that the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house. Now, later in 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 1, it says, as they continued ministering to the Lord, now the fire descended. It says, and when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the house so much, now they could not even enter into the temple. First time they couldn't stand, now they can't even get in. Because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. How beautiful, huh? All right, so... Why did the glory come? Because they were ministering to the Lord. How interesting the, the, the glory of God did not come after they were finished with constructing the temple. And the glory of, of, of the Lord did not come after they offered hundreds of animals as sacrifices. The, the glory came when they ministered to the Lord. That's powerful, huh? So, um, when did God call Paul the Apostle? Was it when he was on the road to Damascus? No. 
What was he doing when God called him? Acts 13 tells us. It says, now there were in, in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets. Now Antioch, of course, is in present-day Syria, northern Syria. And so it says, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod and Saul. And it says, as they ministered to the Lord. And they fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work would I have called them. So when was, when was Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, when was he called? When he what? Ministered to the Lord. Think about all I've said so far. A whole tribe keeps a nation alive, even though they were rebellious. God did not leave them because one tribe was ministering to the Lord. A little boy changed the nation, ministered to the Lord. The glory came when they ministered to the Lord. And the greatest, probably of all the apostles, was called as he what? Ministered to the Lord. He wasn't in Bible school. He just ministered. He knew, he knew how to touch the heart of God. Um, there's one of the most beautiful portions about this in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, and in verse 9. Because this is what happens in heaven all the time. If you can't minister to, to the Lord on earth, you won't be ready for heaven. Because that's the main occupation of heaven, ministering to the Lord. I beheld till the thrones. I think you missed what I said. In heaven, we're not going to be ministering to people. We will not be preaching to anybody. Heaven, for all eternity, you'll do one thing, Minister to the Lord. Are you awake? <laughs> Yawning is not allowed in my presence. A girl back there yawned. Wake up, girl. I just want to just make sure you're listening. <laughs> you won't change me, honey. You won't change me, Jesse. You can pray all you want. I don't want to change. I like the way I am. Okay. Because Jesse said, now, Daddy, don't do that. Now, Daddy, don't say that. Now, Daddy, da, 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 da. I said, look, you can't change me. I'm almost 70. It's too late to change me. But back to this. So important. I beheld till the thrones were cast down. This is verse 9. And the Ancient of Days, what a moment, what a sight did sit whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, his wheels as burning fire, a fiery stream. Think about like a river of fire issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him. Wow. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set. The books were opened. Now, what happened as a, as a result of ministering to the Lord? It is that that brought the destruction of Antichrist. Because the next verse we, we see is, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, or Antichrist, I beheld even till the beast was what? Slain. You want your enemies taken care of? Minister to the Lord, and he'll do the rest. Are you people listening? Don't fight, don't fight your enemy, just minister to the Lord. He'll fight them for you. You'll never have to worry about enemies when you minister to the Lord. Never, 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 never. NBC came at me one time on that program of theirs. And I said, I know exactly what to do. 
start worshiping. The peace that flooded my soul, the joy that filled my heart. And Paul Crouch called, he said, can you do behind the scenes for me? I said, okay. <clears throat> so I went to TBN and it was 5 p.m. live on TBN and I'm sitting there ministering to God's people. And uh, two hours later, the NBC thing was going to air. So uh, a preacher named Steve Hage calls. He says, how can you do this? I said, what? He said, I just watched him behind the scenes. He said, the joy of the Lord is all over you. The peace of God, how do you do that? Tonight they may destroy you. I said, they cannot destroy me. What? I said, you know what Gamaliel said, right? If this work be of God, you can't touch it. I said, if it's not of God, it would have fallen by itself without being attacked. And he said, are you for real? You're so happy? I should have said to him at that time, I've just been with Jesus. So you see, you don't have to worry about your enemies when you minister to the Lord. Because he'll take care of them. I hope you're listening. Yes. Just minister to him. Don't forget, forget them. Don't worry about it. Don't go fighting. Whatever. See, I used to, you know, want to fight. But later on, things changed. You know, you know I've learned my lesson. Just lock your door and minister to the Lord and let him take care of it. It always does. God took care of the Antichrist when they ministered to the Lord. That's a big one. Wow. And so it says very clearly, let's, let's look at uh, Revelation 5. I'm going to show you something else. This is really good. I will let you all preach it if you want to. <laughs> Share it with your friends. It says here in uh, verse 11, of Revelation 5, I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then it says, and every creature which is in heaven on earth, under the earth, such that are in the sea, and all that are in them heard I saying, blessing and glory and honor. What were they doing? Ministering to the Lord. Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And as they kept worshiping, what was the next thing God did? God judged the wicked right after that. It was that worship that moved his hand to judge the world. Because the next thing you see, if you keep reading Revelation, is judgments fall. <laughs> so ministering to the Lord releases judgment on the ungodly. I'm going to give you a secret now. There's some Christians that are harassed by devils. Probably some of you are sitting right here. Don't rebuke them. It will mean nothing to them sometimes. Worship Jesus. And they'll run out so fast, you'll hear the door slam as they're running. <laughs> My parents, before they got saved, used to watch blue movies. I don't think that you know what I just said. <laughs> How many know what I just said? Anybody knows? Oh, my goodness. One or two of you. Well, that's what they called them back then. Filthy movies, <laughs> sexual stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what you call that today, and I'm not interested to know. <laughs> but they, they, they would sit, you know, and watch this stuff. And there were some devils in, in our house because every day we had uh, two ladies come to our home and read our fortunes. That's very, very big in, in our part of the world. Very big. Witchcraft is massive over there. When we grew up, we used to 
uh, pass through the fire, just like it says in the Bible. They would put incense and would pass, would cross it, so the devils go. And of course, that didn't do anything except bring them. Um, and and in our house, we would hear at night, you know, chains and noises at night and fridge opening and closing and ovens on and off and nose everywhere. It was scary and I would hide under the sheets uh, in Jaffa. And then later in Toronto, same thing happened because we had all these girls would come and, and read our palms and teacups and coffee cups and it was crazy stuff. Then, then I got saved, thank God, in the middle of that, of, of all that. And then my room was like, in, like, like heaven. And the whole house was like uh, the other place. <laughs> and so uh, I, would, I was in church every night. Every night I was in church. I mean, well, you know, who would want to stay home? And they would have the Arabic music playing so loud, and oh, it was horrible. And my hedonistic cousins would come, and oh, very, very tormenting experience back then. So I was in church, just having a wonderful time. And I would come home about one in the morning, two in the morning, because I didn't want to come when they're still doing their thing. And I would hear footsteps running, running out of the house like footsteps running. The second I came in, all, all the devils ran out. I have a night after night after night after night. Because I learned one thing. You cannot rebuke them. Just stay in the presence of the Lord. And he'll rebuke them for you. That's just so simple. Have you ever seen people? They, they cast, come out. Come out. And they won't come out. Because they have not experienced what I'm talking about. It's the presence of the Lord. Worship, worship drives demons crazy. When you begin to worship the Lord, they run out of that house, out of your life. So it's so sad you see Christians today in churches, you know, that are mentally troubled and this and that. No. Freedom is, is yours and can happen quickly if you minister to Jesus. Because when you minister to Jesus, he'll show up. And when he shows up, they cannot show up. And all the flaky friends leave too. Because <laughs> they, 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 can't, they can't function in, in, in the presence of the Lord. Someone walked into my place a few days ago and uh, they said, oh my goodness, you, you feel the Lord here. I said, yeah, because I talked to him. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay, of course, of course. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> you know, it's not about, you know, begging and pleading and screaming and shouting uh, in prayer. It's just... Oh, just sit there and love the Lord. Ooh, my, my goodness. Best thing you can do. So, um, <clears throat> let, me, let, let me just say something about this. You, you know why God created you? It says he created you for himself. Right? Isaiah 43. Let's, let's look, look at it. But why did God create us? For himself. Isaiah 43, beautiful portion about what I've been talking about. Verse 7 and verse 21. Even everyone that is called by my name, I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Then you look at verse 21 of that same wonderful chapter. And it says, this people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. Now, um, <clears throat> why and what, what happens? Are you people enjoying this or am I enjoying it? I'm enjoying it way more than you are. Ephesians, Ephesians 1 has a great 
a great answer about what happens when we do this. It says, I'm going to read beginning at verse 16. Ephesians 1, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, word, meaning towards us, who believe according to the working of his mighty power? You know what this is saying to me? It's saying that God created you and me for himself because he wants to give himself to us. He wants to give himself to us. So he created us. Listen now. He created us, not only that we might give ourselves to him, but that he might give himself to us. So it says in Isaiah, I have formed them for myself. I have formed them for myself. Ephesians says, but I want to give them myself. So God formed you for himself to minister to him. And when you minister to him, he gives you himself. And he gives you himself in such a way, it says, watch this, watch this. Verse 17, the God of our Lord Jesus, the Father, may give, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom, revelation in the knowledge of him. He's giving himself. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of your calling. And what, are, what is the riches, watch this, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in you. That is, he's giving you himself. So you can read Isaiah. Okay, God cre created me for himself. But when I touch his heart, he gives me himself. That's heaven on earth. I'm about to shout. But I'll behave myself. It's too early in the morning. So, he created us, watch this now, this is incredible. Look, look, look at me a second. You and I do not have the capacity to receive him. But when we minister to him, he increases our capacity. He enlarges our hearts as we worship him. Isn't that awesome? Like, if God gives us himself, when we're not ready, we'd just blow up. Or we'd die. Something would happen to us. That was never promised even to Moses. God said, listen, you can see my back. That's all you're going to get. But he says to us, I'm all yours. Wow. wow. Moses, only his back, and you and I, all of him. Lift your hands and say, thank you, Lord. So we have way more than Moses could ever have. And he was in God's presence all the time. Because this amazing portion was not given to Moses. What it, what it, it says that God will give you the riches of the glory of his, inherit, of his inheritance in your life. Verse 18. And he will give you the exceeding greatness of his power. Moses was not given that. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Verse 20. That is unbelievable. Like, all of God, it says the fullness of God is ours. The fullness of God is ours. If we only do one thing, touch his heart. Just touch his heart. When I was a kid, my dad was a tough man. Ooh, he was, he scared all of us. All my mom had to say to scare us is, I'm going to tell, tell your dad. That was it. We, we, we revered him. We feared him. He was six foot two, 200 and 
something pounds. He hit me one, one, one time. He slapped me and I flew and hit the wall. I'm not kidding you. I just, I hit the wall. <laughs> he was tough. Anyways, and I didn't even do anything to be slapped, but it doesn't matter. I got it. So when we were kids, I always wanted a toy gun that, made, that had all the colors. You shoot that thing and all the red and the yellow and the blue and would kind of turn back there like that. And he always said no. And I saw that thing in a, in a, in a store and I, I asked and mm -mm, no way. Oh, I didn't know what to do. I wanted that little toy thing so bad. I was, I don't know, three, four, five years, years, years old. I wasn't, I wasn't that old. I wanted that gun so bad. Plastic gun. Plastic. Please don't think anything. <laughs> Just, it made noise. You know, a little noise. That's it. And it had this little nice uh, colors that would roll and, and at the end with the yellow and the blue and the whatever, red colors. And my mom said, uh, go play with his earlobe. I said, what? <laughs> go and tickle his earlobe. Mom, please, no. <laughs> He's gonna slap me or something or whatever he's gonna do. Because my daddy hardly ever showed us any of any affection. I, I don't remember my daddy hugging me when I was a kid. He was just, all oh, man, you know. My mom was the hugger and the lover and mm, all the kisses, all that. With my dad, we would kiss his hand. That was about it, <laughs> out of reverence. We did every, every, every day. He would come and all kiss his hand and it was culture, you know, culture. So I said, okay, I'll go try this thing out. <laughs> I've asked for that toy gun for like a year or more and nothing happened. And she said, go and sit on his knees and tickle his earlobe. I thought, this is it, I'm gonna die. <laughs> so I go, I go and I sit on his, on his lap and I was scared to death to even do anything. So, I, you know, after, after a while I got a little courage and I, and, and, and my mom said, do it, okay. Like she, she knew it was okay. Okay, fine, I'll do it, whatever. So I did this, and he just looked down at me. He said, what do you want? <laughs> yes, he, he was so sweet to me. I thought, oh, wow, this is really working. <laughs> he, and I'm playing the whole time. I think, well, let's not stop. I'm going to keep going. I could ask for maybe 10 guns now. I'll, I'll, I'll get them all. I said, I want that toy gun. He got up. He drove to Haifa, an hour away from Jaffa by car, because that's the only place you could find those guns. And came home and gave it to me. I thought, dear Lord, I just tickled his ear. <laughs> and he took a trip, he, he went to, and he took the bus. Didn't even have a car in those days. He took a public bus to Haifa, got me the, little toy gun, he got me one of them, that's all I wanted, and he came. All my brothers were jealous. <laughs> but back then I wasn't thinking, now I'm thinking, ah, if I can only find God's uh, button. <laughs> what is that special thing that I can do? I found it. Minister to him. He'll give you anything you want. I hope this is helping you. My, my dad, my daddy was a tough man. God is not that tough. My daddy was real tough. Hardly ever even hugged me when I was a kid. But yet, that little did it. He still didn't hug me after, after that. He didn't change anything except I got the gun. That's all I wanted anyways. I didn't want to hug. I was too, too scared to even hug him. But I sure got the gun. 
if you being evil know how to give good gifts, how much more, dear God, lift your hands and thank God for it. How much more will he give us what we want? He gives himself to us. Wow. Okay. <clears throat> why, why is this so important? Well, because, see, when you minister to him, that's when you become what Peter talks about in 1 Peter 2.9. Priests, a royal priesthood. Ministering to him, now he looks upon you as what? A royal priest who ministers to God himself. We are a royal priesthood. And a royal priesthood means we are ministering to the Lord. It has nothing to do with ministering to anyone else. 1 Peter 2.9, I love it. For you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a treasured people. That's what the word peculium is. A treasured people that you should show forth what? The praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we are now kings and priests because we minister to him. Are you listening? So when, when, when the Bible says you are a priest, it doesn't mean you're ministering to the nation. You're ministering to the Lord. Because priests minister to him. And, it's, and, and that word royal sets you aside from priests that minister to somebody else. Forever and forever and forever we will minister to him. And he will give himself to us. Throughout eternity. What an amazing God. This is what makes heaven heaven. So then, God, <clears throat> through Jesus, his son, will, will make every believer a priest that we can stand before him for all eternity. Um, can we go to Exodus 34 for a second? Now, now just quickly before I am, I, am, I am done. Here you see the Lord very angry with Israel. Remember when they built the calf and he wanted to destroy them. Now, Moses is before the presence of God. What does he do that changed the heart of God? What did Moses do <clears throat> where the Lord changed everything? He, he worshipped. He fell on his face and worshipped. <laughs> I love this. So in Exodus 34, thank you, Jesus. And the Lord descended, verse 5, and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and pro proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him, proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and mercy, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, <clears throat> transgressions, and sin that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, unto the third and fourth generation. What did Moses do? Watch verse 8. He ran, he made haste, he bowed his head to the earth and worshipped. It was that act that saved Israel. God was about to destroy them. But his ministering to the Lord changed everything. And there's one more thing I want to say and then I'm really done. The Bible says <clears throat> that God has set his heart upon us. Uh, Jesse, Michael, uh, you are parents. Who moves you more than any, anybody on the planet? Your children, you got it. So our children move us 
like nobody else can move us. So it is with God. God has set his heart upon us. We can move him quicker than any, well, frankly, no angel in heaven has our ability. We move him with just one look. It's over. Isn't that precious? Wow. Think about God. Think about how merciful he is. Hallelujah. All we have to do is touch his heart. I have a lot more to say, but I think I'm done saying what I need to say. Start doing it and start today. It doesn't take long. Just take a few minutes to begin with. Then add a little extra time till it comes like half an hour a day. Just love on him. Think about little Samuel, what he did, how he moved God. How many of you want to hear the voice of God for yourself without going to some prophet to tell you what God says about it? And most of these prophets aren't really prophets. Some of them are a little, not all there. In fact, some, some of them have become psychic, to be honest with you. If you want to hear God for yourself, minister to him. He'll talk to you like he did with Samuel, a little boy. Can we all stand up? I want to pray for you. Hallelujah. Lord, your wonderful people have heard your word today. And Lord, I pray you'll burn in them that holy desire to minister to you. And as they minister to you, you'll give them the ability and the anointing needed to minister for you and touch men and women everywhere. As they minister to you, you'll anoint them to win the lost. As they minister to you, You'll use them to bring healing to the sick and liberty to the oppressed. And as they minister to you, they'll experience true freedom, true liberty in their life. Peace that passeth all understanding. Hallelujah. I give you praise. Now, as you remain standing, I want you all to listen to me. We are living in dangerous times. And the only safety is in Jesus. If you're not living for the Lord, this is a very dangerous hour for you that you may never be able to escape out of it but the, but the Lord has promised us we who walk with him have surrendered to him that our future is secure he said I am with you always even to the end of the age I shall never leave you or forsake you today the world is frightened about the future for the first time. There's new talk about a nuclear war in Europe or some kind of war in Europe. But Jesus said, my peace I give unto you, not as the world knows. Those who are living the life have nothing to worry about. Whatever troubles come, economic, troubles, other troubles, my peace I give unto you, nothing will affect your life, nothing as a believer. But if you're not living the life of a Christian, and the life of a Christian is a life of surrender to the Lord, daily surrender. Just to come to an altar and say, Lord, come into my heart, 
because someone is afraid to burn in hell is not true salvation because Jesus is not a fire escape. We receive him on the basis of love. We receive him because we want to know him, follow him, serve him. We receive him because we truly, truly want to love him. And the Christian life is not about doing. Jesus didn't say do. He said it's done. And all we have to do is surrender. Just surrender. Sin is a cruel enemy and a cruel master. Sin is a terrible master. And sin destroys God said to Israel, the reason you don't have any good things in your life, you've missed so much good, is because of your sin. Sin will enslave you. You'll have no power over it until Jesus truly takes over your life. And then, and only then, you'll be free. What must you do? Well, the Bible tells us, confess your sin and forsake your sin. Whoever confesseth and forsaketh their sin will find mercy. Meaning it's time to say yes to Jesus and mean it by forsaking the way you've been living. Meaning walking away from friends who are ungodly. The Bible says, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and then I will receive you. God will not accept you if you keep your friends who are ungodly. Because it says, what fellowship has light with darkness? Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. You can't have one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world. It's not going to work. It's 100% surrender that brings 100% peace and joy in your life and freedom. So I'm going to ask you, those of you whose life is not solid because you can collapse tomorrow. With all the pressure that's coming, many won't last without a solid foundation and a, an established life in Jesus daily walking with the, with the Lord. And what you have to do is simply give your life to the, to the Lord and never walk away. So as I'm speaking now, those that want to surrender like that, come out of your seats and come stand right here. Because I want to pray with you. I really want to pray with you. If you need to be free from that sin in your life, if you want the Lord to truly deliver you from whatever bondage, get down here now. The anointing is here now. And if that sin, and if that sin keeps returning, it's because you haven't surrendered yet. So come down now, come on, don't wait a minute. Don't even hesitate a second. Come as quickly as you can, because the Lord will meet you at the altar and change your life today. That addiction will be gone. Whatever bondage will be gone. Satan will never touch you again. He cannot touch your life again. If you surrender to the Lord, it's all about Jesus. It's all about the Lord. I want everyone now to lift your hands and pray in the Holy Ghost out loud. Hallelujah. Blessed be your name, Lord. If there's anyone else, come quickly so we can pray for you with these sweet people. Come quickly. 
If you feel your life is not stable and steady and strong, this is the time to say, Lord, I'm not going to play games any longer. I want my life full of your peace, full of your joy. I want my life to be stable where I will not weaken tomorrow. I will not get weak in you tomorrow. I want to stay strong. I want to stay strong. Hallelujah. Blessed be your holy name, Lord. Give me the praise. They are still coming. I'm going to wait. Can you lift your hands and pray in the spirit? Jackson, pray with him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, Father, I pray in Jesus' name, set every one of them free from that sin in their life, from that bondage in their soul. Release them, Lord, from the will of the enemy. Don't allow the enemy's will to be done in their life. I pray in Jesus' name that Satan's plan for them will be destroyed. And your plan will be established in their life. Now all of you say, Dear Jesus, out loud say, Dear Jesus, I need you now. I give you my life. You are the Son of God. The Lord of glory, you died for me. You shed your blood for me. You rose from the dead. And right now, you are seated at God's right hand. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, I need you. Oh, dear Jesus, forgive my sins. Cleanse me with your blood. Make me truly whole and clean. Come into my heart. Live your life in me and through me for your glory. Amen and amen. Can we give the Lord a mighty hand of praise? Hallelujah. Michael, Jesse. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord forever. This is your beginning, your beautiful beginning, all of you, at the altar. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For those that came down, we do this every week. It's so important that you guys pray to Jesus every single day. Get to know him. Read your Bibles every single day. If you don't have a Bible, come find us at the New Believers booth. We will gladly get you a Bible. Fellowship with believers. It's vital that you join a local body of believers. That's church. We would love to have you here. But stand with people that love Jesus more than you. And their hunger will get on you, I promise. And ask the Holy Spirit, and we're going to pray that as we close, to baptize you in power. Because you are going to need the Holy Spirit to live out this Christian life. We all do. Can you pray that over them, Dad? Yes, honey, of course. Lord, fill them with the Holy Spirit, I pray. Give them the power, Lord, of the Holy Ghost. They might live lives victorious victorious lives in the holy precious name of Jesus we give you the praise and God's people said amen Jesse and Michael I'm so excited about your future what God is about to do through you both and I'm going to give the mic back to Michael or Jesse but I, I, I tell you, I've, I've sensed this over and over and over about the new building. God is going to do some mighty things in that amazing place. And, and uh, the, the school, 
God is going to visit the school when you move in there in a very massive way. And I told you, I said, nothing will happen till you're in that building because the glory of God will be there. And, and I don't know who's listening and I don't know who's thinking about Jesus' school. Oh, don't let that divine opportunity pass because what God will do in that school is going to be really heavenly. Love you and God bless you. And I'm glad it's your birthday and Joshua's birthday this week when we're going to celebrate. Kisses. Thank you. Can we just thank him for coming? That was beautiful. Yeah. If you need prayer, and if you need prayer, um, our prayer team is going to come down. We'd love to pray for you. We love you. Baptisms are tonight at church. Come hungry and expectant. We'll see you tonight and next Sunday morning. We love you guys. Michael and Jess here. We are standing on the exact location where the headquarters for Jesus Image will be. Local church, Jesus School, uh, House of Bethany, all of that will be located right here. In fact, in the exact spot where Jesse and I are standing will be the beautiful pond in front of the sanctuary where we will most likely be holding baptism services occasionally. So we're so excited. We're right here in Seminole County off of Lake Mary Boulevard. We own this land. God owns this land, I should say. And the building will be right behind us. The sanctuary, the admin building, and the prayer house. And so listen, we just want to say thank you so much. Thank you for standing with us. Thank you for giving. Thank you for praying. Thank you for being so patient and believing with us. We're believing God that the nations will descend on this property, that they will worship Jesus, that the sick will be healed here, that the lost will be saved, that the presence and glory of God will rest here. We want that, we believe this is holy ground and that the tangible glory of Jesus will be right here on this land. And so we wanna invite you to come and invite you to be a part of what God is gonna do here. Yeah, we are just so very thankful for you. Thank you so much for your prayers and your love and support. We are truly blown away with what the Lord is doing and we cannot wait to have you here with us one day. Yeah, and we're really excited about what we're gonna show you right now. We wanna take you on a journey and show you the incredible design, detail, and vision of what will take place on this property. Our Jesus Image home will be located in the beautiful Seminole County right off of Lake Mary Boulevard. This is a thriving area filled with families, restaurants, and the beautiful amenities that this area provides. The vision of this property is simple. We want the presence of Jesus Christ to be known. We have a deep value for experiencing the Lord in His beauty and the majesty of His creation. This facility will host our local church family, Jesus School, which is our discipleship training program yearly conferences, the Bethany House of Prayer, and it will also be an outreach hub for the state and nation. There is vision behind everything. The location of the buildings, the landscaping, the water features, and of course the architectural design of the buildings themselves all speak to the beauty of the Lord. We want all who enter the property to feel as though they've entered into the peace of the presence of God. With all the stress and turmoil that people face on a daily basis, this will be a place of serenity, worship, reflection, and adoration. Rather than this feeling like a headquarters, we want this to be the house of God and a home for His people. You will notice that the structures themselves have a timeless look and design. From the stonework to the stained glass, it will feel like the house of God. The gospel will be declared from every side of the property in multiple different ways. As you pull into the new Jesus Image home, you will discover a massive parking area that will be framed by and filled with beautiful shrubbery and trees. There will be plenty of room for you and your family. A beautiful drive leads you to the sanctuary building. You will enter through a stone archway. Upon the archway, one of the foundational verses for Jesus' image will be inscribed. This verse carries the heartbeat of our lives and the construction of this house. Only one thing is needed, Luke 10, 42. 
Upon entering the front door to the main building, you will see a massive gathering area. It is a two-story structure. The first level will be filled with life. This will be a place to congregate with friends and family, to get your children checked into children's church, to eat, or simply enjoy a coffee around a beautiful fireplace. The first level will also house the youth room. We have a major focus on seeing this next generation love Jesus. The youth room will seat approximately 500 people. This room will also serve as the second year facility for Jesus School. Our children's rooms will be located on the first level. This will be a convenient experience for children and parents upon their arrival. Our children will receive amazing Bible teaching, a worship experience, and knowledge of the presence of the Holy Spirit for themselves. The second level of the main building will facilitate working spaces for our board of directors, our staff, and interns. This will be a great blessing for us as we move forward in wisdom as a ministry. As you know, God has graced Jesus' image with a massive reach through media. Thousands have come to Jesus, and so many have been healed and set free through our media ministry. We will have our very own production studio where we can create content and continue to stream live to the nations. We will release podcasts, social media content, videos, and much more. Multiplied millions have watched our media content, and we believe our creative team will flourish in this new space as they step out into this vital and anointed calling. As you walk across the main gathering space, you will discover the sanctuary. What an amazing space this will be. While we will have state-of-the-art technology in the sanctuary, the space will take you back in time, a time when churches had a sacred feel to them. You will discover beautiful stained glass behind the platform. Stained glass will line the sides of the sanctuary as well, all telling the gospel story of Jesus. There will be timeless wood beaming and stonework throughout. We long for his presence to fill this place, and it will be a home for you as well. We will seat approximately 1,500 people, yet it will not lose the personal feel that we so deeply value. The platform will be spacious with plenty of room for ministry, our worship teams, and of course, a baptismal. You will notice a round stained glass image on the back wall of the sanctuary depicting a dove in fire descending in the room. May the Holy Spirit fill our hearts each time we gather as a church family. The sanctuary space will also serve Jesus School. This will house our hundreds of first year students as well as our general school sessions. These students will be missionaries to the nations of the world and to their generation. The gospel will be declared from this sanctuary space multiple times per week and people will be raised up from this place to share Jesus with the world. And may millions be saved, healed, and touched by the Holy Spirit. Lastly, for our favorite space on the property, the Bethany House of Prayer. This will be the prayer house for Jesus' image. It will be a place for adoration, silent prayer, reflecting upon the scriptures, and worship. You will notice that the house will be built upon a pond. The setting will be quaint and breathtaking. Stone and wood mark the space with warmth and a traditional look that we believe will transcend generations. We believe this will be the hub of the entire property, a place where intimacy with God and pure prayer ascend before Him. It is named the Bethany House because Bethany was the place where Jesus was loved deeply. Therefore, He rested there. Mary found the better part, and it is our prayer that all who enter will find Jesus there and fall in love with Him. May Jesus be pleased with all that takes place here. May he be adored and worshiped on this property. May his word be taught with clarity, boldness, and love. May his gospel flood the nations, and may the generations to come find him here. Will you stand with us? Will you pray and give toward this vision? Will you give sacrificially for the sake of Jesus and his gospel? Will you be a part of something that will outlive you for the sake of eternity? Thank you. We love you. Jesus is beautiful.